Hey everybody, this is Michael Barrier. I'm a critical care flight paramedic with uh, Vident East Care at Vident Medical Center in Greenville, North Carolina. And this is the PEEP talk that I gave at uh, Critical Care Transport Medicine Conference this year, 2018 in San Antonio. Um, really quick, uh, you can take your phone and snap that QR code and that'll take you to a download page for the show notes. Or there's a clickable link down in the description where you can get a PDF copy of the references and other things which relate to this lecture. Um, On to the housekeeping. I have no financial conflicts to disclose, but I do want to talk about a conflict I have about our understanding in pre-hospital care and critical care transport about PEEP. And it's the way we use it and the way we understand it. And that's really why I decided to do this talk, and that's why you'll notice you didn't see a name for the lecture on the first slide, because I went back and forth about what to call it. Um, this is the title that was in the lecture handout, quite frankly, because I had to call it something when I submitted for it. But the more I thought about this name, the more it sounded a little too dramatic and Grey's Anatomy for me. Um, so I thought of something else, and I thought this one took us back to our roots a little bit and really highlighted our desire to always make our intentions honorable, but it wasn't quite right either. Uh, the one I ultimately settled on was this, and it really captured the spirit of what I wanted to do. Um, it seemed to be the most accurate, especially when I went looking for literature, which we'll get to that in just a minute, and it's probably the closest I'm ever going to get to doing a TED Talk. But one of the things I love about TED Talks is they are all about what people believe about technology and design. And this is what I believe about PEEP. Whether you're talking about this very simple gadget that I'm sure most of you probably have, or this slightly more complex gadget, I believe that PEEP is often unknown or overlooked or forgotten outside the hospital. And inside the hospital, I believe it is often applied either by rote or by habit, or based on faulty understanding of PEEP's role in the therapy of our sickest patients. And that is why I champion loudly not only the use of PEEP, but a greater understanding of the bedrock physiology that informs every knob turn and dial twist on the ventilator that we do. And to advocate loudly to put PEEP valves on every transport vehicle in America. Ultimately, what I learned by putting this discussion together, as is often the case when I study a subject exhaustively for a year or so, as I have PEEP, is that I don't know anything. Um, I go into these discussions, and especially this one with PEEP, thinking that I understand what it is and what I'm going to say and that all the things I've been teaching for all this time are right, and I find out that's not true at all. And for some of that, I blame myself. Maybe I just didn't study hard enough. But when it comes to PEEP, I don't think that's true at all. And one of the biggest reasons is when you think about most of what we know about PEEP or what we think we know, almost all the data in the literature is based on studies about ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And while ARDS is definitely important, the funny thing about that to me is that when I first began my critical care education, they talked in class about ARDS a lot. And I genuinely left that class believing that I was going to transport 25 patients with ARDS a week. When in truth, I bet I haven't transported 25 in my career. As a matter of fact, the data on ARDS suggests that they make up only about 5% of the ventilated patients in ICUs all over the world, in the world, which begs a really important question. What about the rest of our vented patients? You know, virtually everybody else. Is there, what's the right way to use PEEP for them, or does it even matter? Well, of course it matters. There's some data out there. You just got to look a little harder for it because of the way they structure these studies to specifically exclude people with ARDS and people who are hypoxemic so we can study the effect of PEEP on what we think of as normally oxygenating people. But when you start thinking about that question, what about everybody else, it can get really big really fast. And so when I started thinking about what I wanted to discuss in this particular conversation, um, the most liberating thing was, first of all, I was going to be in a room full of people who do critical care for a living, you know, physicians, nurses, paramedics, respiratory therapists. So I wasn't going to have to explain what PEEP was. 
so I could focus on some questions that I had had over the years and I asked some of my colleagues. And I was able to, to break it down into four things that I really felt like I needed to know or needed to know better. And here's the questions I came up with. Um, is physiologic peep really a thing? Um, do we need to clamp the ET tube every time we break the, e the vent circuit? Is PEEP really to blame for your patient's hypotension? And is zero PEEP ever okay? So those are our questions, so here we go. I'm sure everybody has heard of physiologic PEEP. And that's the concept of a certain amount of expiratory pressure afforded to us by the narrowed glottis or other mechanisms in the airway. Um, and I've said it myself to a class full of new hires at least six times a year for the past five years when we talk about mechanical ventilation for the first time. So, so having said that, let me ask you, what is the value for physiologic PEEP? I often hear numbers like two, three, five centimeters of water. And as you consider your answer, the next question I would ask is for you to prove it. Um, because the literature on this is either very old or very soft. A lot of what we know or think we know about physiologic peeps comes from, a, comes from a pretty obscure and not terribly easy to find 30-year-old article by that name in which uh, Mr. Robert Smith there, a respiratory therapist, defined physiologic peep. And here you see it there, the application of low level of peep um, to intubated patients to produce neuronormal pulmonary function on the presumption that normal pulmonary mechanics and gas exchange are dependent upon a functional glottis. But if you go forward to read this paper, and I've got a link to it in the show notes, um, though again, it's hard to find, he seems pretty skeptical of that himself. But even before he wrote this article, that concept of physiologic peep was under fire in one of the only human trials, albeit very small, I think it was like 10 patients, and non-randomized, to try to tackle this issue, and they come up with their own doubts about that. Um, in more current publications, the language has gotten a little sharper um, to pretty dismissive language like saying that the level of PEEP is arbitrary in these cases or it's just what we've always done. Um, to the slightly more caustic, it's a myth. To the sort of hostile, we misuse PEEP. PEEP should not routinely be used on intubated patients at all, and there is no such thing. Now, while I did not expect such a wide range of strong opinions, there is some teeth to the argument against physiologic PEEP when you consider normal mammalian earthling physiology, or and specifically the difference between spontaneous respirations and positive pressure ventilation. See, every bit of our spontaneous ventilation occurs under negative pressure. And this is probably a good place to talk about how important the diaphragm really is. Because we know, of course, the diaphragm, when it contracts, it pulls downward and inflates the lungs passively and gently with atmospheric air. But a recent study suggests that the diaphragm is important during exhalation also through a mechanism called diaphragmatic breaking. When, in conjunction with, uh, presumably, the narrowed glottis provides an effect mentioned for the first time I ever saw it in the Smith article called expiratory breaking. And this is designed to slow down expiratory flow, ostensibly to maintain recruitment. And this is also mentioned that some people do this purposefully. Um, this is when you see people breathing through pursed lips or whistling, those folks like with asthma or COPD, when they're trying to maintain their own recruitment or what we think of as auto peep. Um, normal breathing is it's easy in and it's easy out, and it's just very gentle. Positive pressure ventilation, on the other hand, is offensive. We force hyperoxygenated air into the lungs under comparatively immense pressures. And then, and this is the important part, instead of the diaphragm contracting to start the whole process and moving out of the way, the diaphragm is now flaccid and has to be pushed out of the way by those inflating lungs. And this kind of movement requires extra air and extra force. And even more important is when it lets go. The breaking action of the diaphragm on the breath out is lost, which allows the diaphragm, once those lungs are out of the way, to just snap back to its original position, and the chest wall falls back down to its resting position. And this gives us our new word for the week, which is expiratory crash. And don't bother looking for that one in the literature, because I made that one up. 
But I believe it's this crash of the diaphragm snapping back up to its original position and the chest wall falling back down to its original position that we are working to mitigate with our peep selection. What I hypothesize to you is that the minimal peep that we set on the ventilator or the bag valve mask that we've often referred to as physiologic peep is necessary to compensate for the force of that crash. In other words, that minimal peep setting is required by the mechanical ventilation itself. See, at the end of normal expiration, so right now if you take a deep, a deep breath in and then you let it out and you stop, you stop breathing out when you equalize pressure between your lungs and the outside air. So essentially, your end expiratory pressure is zero. But when we set a PEEP, either on the ventilator or the PEEP valve, we've set a minimum pressure we're going to allow at any time. In other words, we've set a hard stop. And that difference is important between positive pressure ventilation and normal spontaneous ventilation. Um, if you've never taken a vent or a, a PEEP valve apart, and I'm sad to say that I have, then you would see that all it is is a bottle stopper with a controlled set leak. And what that leak does is it will allow outflow at a slowed pace, so a, with some braking, and it's going to stop that outflow when it equalizes whatever you set it at. So if you set your peep of 10 on your valve or your ventilator, once the airway pressure reaches 10, the outflow is just going to stop. So we don't really apply positive pressure at all when we use a PEEP valve or PEEP on the ventilator, what we're doing is we're controlling expiratory outflow. In truth, the only true PEEP that we ever apply comes through non-invasive positive pressure ventilation like CPAP or BiPAP. Whenever during that expiratory phase, we are forcing air, we're applying that much pressure to the airway. In cases of PEEP valves and things like that, all we're doing is controlling the patient's own outflow until we reach the pressure that we want and then we stop it. And again, whichever one of those we do that is different than what we do in normal ventilation. So what we really do with PEEP valves or the ventilator is what I've come to think of as targeted end expiratory flow obstruction. Now granted, TIFO doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well as PEEP, so maybe we'll just keep PEEP for the time being just to be simple. But we should always regard this application of PEEP with the ventilator with a PEEP valve not as benign or physiologic, but it's actually therapeutic. And one of the biggest reasons is it plays a big role in the maintenance of mean airway pressure. And mean airway pressure is the way that we drive oxygenation the greatest through whether it's non-invasive ventilation or through with somebody who is intubated. And because this application of PEEP is augmenting rather than replacing a physiologic mechanism, even a minimal amount, like say five centimeters of water worth of PEEP, can decrease the work of breathing by as much as 40% in somebody on the ventilator. And it also has some other physiologic benefits, which we're going to touch on in just a few minutes. So I can't really see a show of hands, but just think in your mind, how many of you clamp the ET tube regularly when you disconnect the circuit? Okay. Probably a few of you are raising your hands up there, out there in YouTube land. Well, this practice highlights a pretty big problem with a lot of the non-ARDS peep research, and then it's almost all animal studies. Um, it's studies that involve pigs and goats and rabbits and dogs and rats. It's such a huge part of our clinician's practice, probably you and your peers and, and those people you you follow and look up to probably do this, but it's supported by almost no human evidence whatsoever. You see a couple there on the screen were really the two closest things I could find. Uh, one of those was a conference abstract. You see they used a test lung. Another one um, used injured pigs. There's some great videos out there um, from Flightbridge Ed and from Sydney Hems where they demonstrate that clearly if you clamp the ET tube, you're going to maintain recruitment. There is no doubt about the fact that it works in cadaveric models and in animal studies. But there is virtually no supporting data. So why do we do it? Well, I think we do it because it works, or at least we think it works, and because there are some things we do know about this physiology. For example, we know that a single breath at zero peep may require as much as 35 centimeters of water of pressure on the following breath to achieve the same recruitment. 
And in that case, that amount of pressure that it requires to get that recruitment back is all driving pressure. And we know that high driving pressures or high plateau pressures equal lung injury. We also know that cyclical de-recruitment and re-recruitment are independently associated with lung injury, which incentivizes us to maintain recruitment as much as possible. And we know, of course, that circuit disconnects result in lost recruitment and in things like atelectasis and VAP. So what do we know about clamping the two? I think the biggest thing we know is that we need to know more. And maybe after that, the most important thing to remember is that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because there's no data out there that supports it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, and speaking of lack of data, if anybody out there is doing this at your place and it works, consider writing that up and writing it down and publishing it because we need more human studies on this to, to truly validate what we're doing. PEEP has long had a reputation, of course, for what it's for, which is bringing good oxygenation numbers to sick folks, um, sometimes at the expense of their hemodynamics. And if we think back to ARDS for just a second, um, we've all seen that patient in the ICU that required so much vasopressor support that by the time they got discharged, they had lost fingers and toes. And this is at least partially attributed to excessive amounts of PEEP that required to oxygenate those folks when they were really, really sick. But I bet chances are pretty good, too, that you've gone to get that patient who was on a PEEP of 8 with a blood pressure of 70 over 30, and they were turning the PEEP down because it was making the patient hypotensive. Um, the mechanism at work here is pretty straightforward, but it's probably not as dramatic as you might think. We know that static alveolar pressure associated with the high PEEPs is transmitted outward toward the rigid thoracic cage and inward to the mediastinum. And because the heart and the great vessels are softer, they will collapse first, which would result in decreased right ventricular preload and a subsequent decrease in cardiac output. This effect has been studied in ARDS patients again, um, where there was indeed found um, up to a 25% instance of core pulmonale and reduction in cardiac output. But again, we have to ask the question, what about the other 95% of our patients, the ones who don't have ARDS? And the evidence may surprise Several things about this mechanism are contradictory, like virtually all of the, the PEEP literature. First of all, it seems that the inferior vena cava suffers very little of this compression, while the superior vena cava and the right atrium itself are far more susceptible. And this may lend some weight to the notion that I've heard before that PEEP should be avoided in folks with closed head injuries, as it may impede or cranial venous drainage. Though, surprise, surprise, this evidence is pretty thin also. But truthfully, in non-ARDS euvolemic patients, peeps of as high as 21 centimeters of water have been well tolerated without any hemodynamic compromise. And this gives us the one concrete piece of advice I could find to give you, which is if you believe a peep of 10 is causing your patient to become or remain hypotensive, you've probably missed something important. As a matter of fact, some references suggest that an improvement in cardiac output is evident for patients with left ventricular failure as it helps to offload that left ventricle. And this led to our last runner up for the lecture title, just because. I always love when a lecture teaches me a new word and though ZEEP was not a new word to the world, it was new to me. And this leads us to our last question. Is ZEEP or zero PEEP ever okay? A couple things I learned about this was it's an easy way to start a fight amongst respiratory therapists because they all have some pretty strong opinions about whether this is true. And it's a question that is best asked in the context of ventilating some of the toughest patients we have and those with asthma. And once you get through the debate about um, high tidal volumes versus low tidal volumes and high rates versus low rates and high flow versus low flow, the question of PEEP remains. And it's an incredibly good question. Because you have to ask, if a patient already has trouble with expiratory flow, does it make any sense at all to add a mechanism that restricts expiratory flow even more? And when I was at the live conference, when I asked this question, I could see people shaking their head or, or nodding their head, and they were already choosing up sides on what they believed was true. The literature is equally contradictory. Uh, one camp says that applied PEEP, PEEP E, can help overcome intrinsic PEEP, PEEP I, through a waterfall effect. 
Uh, on the other hand, some folks argue that PEEP shouldn't be used for these patients ever. Further, one group found a 53% reduction in worker breathing by adding PEEP to the ventilator for asthmatics, while another said it had no place whatsoever. So what's the truth? The truth is, it depends. Because not only can we not treat all asthmatics the same, we can't even treat the same asthmatic the same way every single time. And this disease is funny that way. Here's the best line I read from this discussion. The acutely diseased lung is not uniform in its mechanical properties, but rather a complex meshwork of interdependent but heterogeneously affected subunits. Asthmatic lungs change over time. Hell, they change over the course of a single exacerbation. Some lung units may be completely shunted, while others are completely open. <clears throat> That's what gives us the shark fin intertidal CO2 waveform, a loss of alveolar plateau secondary to inconsistent alveolar emptying. We have about 600 million alveoli in the average adult human lung, and each one of those attached bronchioles may react differently. I hypothesize that taking away all of the peat may very well help relieve some of the gas trapping, but perhaps at the cost of de-recruitment of good lung units. This one, too, is still way up in the air. It is worth noting, however, that it makes no difference what you do with the ventilator if you don't get their lungs open with bronchodilators and the other standard treatments. So this brings us to our bonus question. Um, I always like to bring a little extra. What if you don't have a peep valve? Well, we talked that all PEEP really is, is controlled outflow obstruction. So how can you control the outflow through a bag valve mask if you don't have a PEEP valve? Well, because I got free time and I'm that guy. Um, I rigged up our ventilator to measure our PEEP valves for accuracy. I wondered if we were really getting what we thought we got out of those. And what you see I did here was I ran the ventilator circuit to the patient connected on a BVM. So a breath from the ventilator is like an exhalation through the bag valve mask. So the measured peak inspiratory pressure on the ventilator is actually the amount of outflow resistance or PEEP through the bag valve mask. And you can see here that our PEEP valves, the ones we use, I have no idea what brand they are, so I'm not endorsing, um, are pretty accurate. But this led me to consider what we could do in a pinch if we didn't have a PEEP valve, and I thought of a really, really complex solution, tape. Exhalation port on this bag valve mask is one inch in diameter. By covering that with a piece of two inch silk tape and cutting a hole, and I cannot stress enough how important the hole is, but you cut a hole right through the middle of that, you can generate a predictable amount of peep. So you can see here we cut a one inch slit right through the middle of the exhalation valve and we were able to generate about nine a peep. By doing a three quarter inch hole, that generated about 12. Um, a couple things about this, it has to be an independent exhalation valve like you see on this particular bag valve mask. I forget this brand, it's the one we carry. Um, but you see the exhalation valve is out to the side. I think Ambu Spurs are kind of the same way. Um, the integrated exhalation valves that are right above the duckbill valve won't really work as well. Um, so to wrap it up, um, we'll answer the questions. Is physiologic PEEP a thing? Probably not. Um, probably need to call it something else if we did. Uh, while there is an expiratory braking mechanism at work that seems to be lost during mechanical ventilation, that minimal PEEP setting appears to be more therapeutic than physiologic. Um, the Smith article I cited from 30 years ago ends with a transcript of a roundtable discussion that used the label compensatory PEEP, and I think that's probably more accurate. We add that outflow obstruction and a hard stop at the end, we're really offsetting that expiratory crash. Um, from the diaphragm snapping back into position and the chest wall falling back down. And when that happens, I think we lose some of our functional residual capacity, maybe all of it. And adding that PEEP does something to help offset that that we don't we would normally get just from spontaneous breathing. Um, is clamping the ET tube really necessary? Probably so. Um, we know enough about the mechanism that we're trying to preserve and about the ones we're trying to prevent to believe that something simple like just clamping the ET tube when you break the circuit is probably a good idea. Um, and if you're an academic out there listening, consider this your call to action that we need to get some studies, some human studies on the books about this one because we just don't have any. Um, is PEEP to blame for your patient's hypotension? Probably not. 
unless it is. Um, and it may be if your patient has ARDS, then the chances that that excessively high PEEP may be to blame. Um, but if not, and they're on a relatively low PEEP setting, like 12 or less, then there's probably something else going on. And regardless of whether the PEEP is super high or not, if they're hypotensive, turning the PEEP down is probably not going to help a whole lot. We need to treat their volume problem or their blood pressure problem in a different way. And finally, is zero PEEP ever okay? Um, again, probably not. While I wouldn't, and the literature certainly doesn't, recommend high PEEPs for patients with outflow obstructions like um, asthma exacerbations, the, ev the evidence is also soft that the absence of PEEP is the answer either. Because of that expiratory breaking mechanism afforded by the PEEP, if that's absent, that equates to something like negative PEEP, where we start actually losing pressure. And some of that amount of extrinsic PEEP may aid in the relief of intrinsic PEEP and may very well help maintain recruitment in the unaffected lung units, again, thinking about um, asthma exacerbations. And these things will aid in overall ventilation. That's all I got. Thanks again for watching. Um, the QR code's there on the screen. If you snap the one on the left, that's going to get you the show notes. If you snap the one on the right, that's my contact information. Of course, that's listed there on the screen also. And don't forget the clickable link down in the show notes. This is going to be on Twitter and Facebook. Please share it around anybody you think would like it. And I'll see you guys soon.